evaluation, because this is the one thing that we struggle with, all of us in the field forever, is how do we evaluate the consult process? Um, and who do we about? Who do we ask the questions? And, and what tool do we use? And these are things that I think are in progress and we're working on. And some folks have already kind of started some way of, of evaluating, but we'll go through some of the um, issues here. Um, and one, the main question is, can meaningful evaluations of ethics consultation be done? Can you critically evaluate the ethics consult process and outcome? Can it be accurately evaluated? And if so, how do you do this? Um, who would be the evaluator? Would you survey the patient, the family members, the physician, other staff that were involved, nursing, social work, chaplain, or all of them? And which outcomes uh, would be considered a success and which one's a failure? You know? And we know we're mindful of evaluation and outcome evaluation because our employers want to see that we make a difference or that we have some kind of role that isn't just um, to talk, you know, we want to know what the outcome is. So there's been a lot of early studies, and the one that um, I, I, I put a couple of these on, on the slide presentation, but in 92, LaPuma um, et al. did an evaluation study called Community Hospital Ethics Consultation Evaluation in Comparison with the University Hospital Service. And they, they said that their objective was to examine three aspects of ethics consultation. The clinical question asked, the helpfulness of the consultation to requesting physicians, and the difference between consultations performed at community teaching and those performed at university. So this is kind of an early study. Um, the subjects were physicians who formally requested ethics consultation as well as the patients for whom they requested them. Their method was a two-year um, prospective evaluation. So the physician and the ethics consultant completed a questionnaire after completion of the consultation. So what they found, and this is really kind of hard to read, um, is that most people found the process helpful. Now again, we didn't in clarify the issue, um, the overall educational utility, those kind of things. Um, and the patient care also was um, positive for the most part. So it seemed to be useful, the process was useful. But the main take from items in the study were that physicians found that the consult was very helpful um, in one or more aspects of patient care and ethics education. So that was good. Um, and no information on the costs incurred as a result of the consultation, changes in clinical decision making process uh, from patients and families' satisfaction with ethics consultations. So it was mostly the sum physician, um, did they like it or not? So that was the beginning, but it wasn't really useful um, like in today's time when we really want to look at outcomes. Um, there was another study in 93, Effectiveness of an Ethics Consultation Service. Um, this was an important study, and you can uh, look it up to get the full uh, content, but it was in 1993, and the Ethics Consult Service was new. So they wanted to evaluate the service, and they sent a questionnaire to the attending physicians for the evaluation of the service. 46 patients from five clinical departments were studied. And the results, the attending physician found the consultations to be important in clarifying ethical issues, educating the team, and increasing confidence in decisions. Sorry, there's a typo. And in patient management in more than 90% of the cases. So 90% of these uh, 46 uh, found it very useful. But the consultations resulted in significant changes in patient management with only 36% of the time. So if we're measuring outcomes by our evaluation, by change in, in decision making or practice, less than 50%. That's not so good. But again, it's really hard to do. Um, so in 96 was a big year. So we're now up to 96. Uh, there were several studies published that looked at the evaluations and consultations. Um, this the one by Fox and Tulsi was evaluation of medical ethics consultation service. Um, I'm sorry, that was in the Journal of Clinical Ethics. And it, it was devoted to the topic. So there is a, if you go to the journal, um, pretty much every article is, is looking at the evaluation. Kind of but it was mostly, again, just kind of clarifying issues and not really telling us things we didn't know. Dr. Orr then expanded his previous study where um, they uh, asked the physicians questions and he wanted to evaluate the medical ethics consultation service from the patient and family perspective. So now we're kind of getting into a different arena. 
So we surveyed patients and families, and the purpose was to determine whether patients and family members found the ethics consultation to be helpful, and if they were satisfied with the treatment decisions made. So they did a telephone interview a few weeks after uh, hospital discharge. Uh, they had a uh, subject uh, population of 86, but 56 interviews complete. So that was a fairly good outcome. And the results were that 57% found ethics consultation to have been helpful. 4% found them to have been detrimental. And they were more likely of, to found the consult helpful if they perceived that it had resulted in a change in treatment and were less likely to have found it helpful when the patients were more seriously ill or died. So that kind of, we, that's, that helped us, you know, it stands to reason, but now we had some data to show this. Um, but I mean, in this day and age of quality improvement, you know, this was a little bit helpful. We found that even though we can't charge for that consult service, from a third party, so in some cases you can, but most cases you cannot, it seemed like patients were happy, and that was, that was important. Now, the McClug study uh, was the Evaluation of Medical Ethics Consultation Service, Opinions of Patients and Healthcare Providers. This study surveyed both professional staff and patients' families and their perceived effectiveness in bioethics consultation. 20 cases were reviewed with 96% physicians, 95% nurses, and 65% family uh, responses. But it, again, it was a small, 20, pretty small, but it, it might have been like a, a jump start study for something bigger down the road. But the conclusions were that patient and family members and professional staff have different perceptions regarding the value of bioethics consultation. This is important for us to, to measure. Patient and family members cited lack of communication with professional staff as the primary re reason for responding negatively to the survey. And there's clearly a large gap between the perceptions of physicians and those of patient and family members regarding what constitutes adequate communication. Again, the, the uh, end was only 20, but this is somewhat useful information for us. Now in this one, you can see that um, the group surveyed physician, nurses, patient, families. Looking at the overall rating of the consults, um, most of them were very helpful, or somewhat helpful. Very few were not helpful at all. The patient and families found six uh, didn't find it helpful at all. So again, I don't know how quite to, to read this data. Again, it's a small study. But in those cases which the outcome was seen as unsatisfactory, the family's opinion of the value of the consult remained negative. So again, are we, you know, it's tricky to do satisfaction, you know, because if we have a bad outcome or, the, or we've decided that, you know, we don't think further aggressive treatment is necessary and the family thinks it is, they may say, well, that ethics consult was just not helpful at all. You know, it was very negative. And it is possible that anger about perceived communication lapses between families, patients, and healthcare team may, in some instances, have been transferred to the ethics consultant. And like I say, a lot of times, I don't think families often can remember me from the six other doctors and 20 nurses and therapists that come in the room, especially if their loved one's really sick. Um, we know through communication research that people tend to, in stressful situations, only hear about every what? Fifth, six word, sometimes at the most, sometimes more, but it's just hard. They've had so much information. So again, what are we going to do? So Fox came out with another um, uh, journal article in 96 um, and gave some very insightful uh, and essential tasks for planning evaluation, but not... You know, this is, again, how to plan for it. Um, and you can read those. They're very useful things. Um, and number five, the creation of a reliable and valid instrument to effectively um, evaluate. We've yet to come up with one of those. Um, but we need to. The task, this was the take home for this article, the task outlined in this conceptual framework are all prerequisite to rigorous evaluative research. But we're not there yet. I guess part of this um, presentation is to, I'll get some feedback too from the colleagues here, but to encourage you to maybe be that person to come up with the, the right tool. There was another controversial study by Schneiderman in 2000, and you may know this one. It was Impact of Ethics Consultation in the Intensive Care Setting, a randomized controlled trial. This was <coughs> the first and maybe the only um, study so far that looked at randomization of patients in the ICU to a ethics consult or not an ethics consult. So they either got one or they didn't on admission. So whether, uh, what they wanted to determine was whether ethics consultation in the ICU setting reduces non-beneficial treatment, 
uh, defined at days in the ICU and treatments delivered to those patients who ultimately fail to survive to hosp uh, the hospital or discharge, and whether physicians, nurses, social workers, and patient family agree that ethics <coughs> consultation in the ICU are beneficial in addressing treatment conflicts. So this was a prospective randomized controlled study on ethics. Uh, it was set in a medical center in pediatric ICUs in a university medical center. We had 74 patients in whom value-based treatment conflicts arose during the course of treatment. And patients were randomly assigned to either the intervention, which was the ethics consultation, or non-intervention arm, which was the consult wasn't offered. What they found was the medical data in the ICU hospital days were compared between the intervention and the control group before and after randomization. So non-beneficial treatment, namely days of ICU, and life-sustaining treatments in patients who died before discharge. They did a Likert scale, and commentary responses were recorded to structure an open-ended interview with the responsible physicians, nurses, social workers, and families of the patient assigned to the intervention arm within one month after death or discharge. So it was a very well-developed study. Their survey questions were looking at identifying ethical issues. Uh, analyzing the issues, to resolve the ethical issue, to educate uh, about the issue, issue, and to present personal views. So they would ask these kind of questions. The main results, there were no difference in overall mortality between the control patients and those receiving consults. But and ethics consultations were associated with reductions in ICU hospital days and life-sustaining treatment in those patients who ultimately failed to survive to discharge. So ethics consultations were regarded favorably by most participants. This is, a risk, uh, this is our hospital administration's you know, gold mine. They want to see this kind of data, right, to help support our physicians. And we want to see it in some way, shape, or form to help continue to promote our ethics consultation. Can I ask a question? Is the, is the reason for evaluating, I mean, it's sort of what's the goal of care? What's the reason for evaluating? Is it to justify the existence of the ethics consultants? Is that I think that's an important reason, um, but usually it's to see how effective the process is. That's how I see it, and I've been trying to figure out what is the measure of outcome. Right, and effectively, what's, what's the end point you're looking for? So um, mm -hmm. It's not whether or not we got a decision, in my mind, although that might be something I want to measure. It was the process helpful in the family to make a decision if they needed to make a decision. If they already said, nope, we want to go full blow, you know, X, Y, Z, full ahead, then they've made their decision. It's those people that are kind of, you know, really kind of searching for that. But again, it's really hard. It's really and, hard. And an ethics committee that's, an, ethic, an ethicist who's paid by the hospital justifying themselves based on cost savings starts to get a little worrisome to me. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. But again, I mean, we all levels of care providers, right, in this day and age, are being assessed by how much they can save the institution. But aren't we supposed to be the one that stands above that? Yeah. Uh, and I think that, our, that mostly our salaries can be justified because it's important for us to be there. And that kind of thing, but it doesn't hurt to have something like this, according to Schneiderman. That was kind of an unintended consequence, even though they may have thought about that. And I'll, I would like to pick your brain on, on your, what you've been working on for evaluation. But it's just really hard because that was my all, ultimate question: Is am I do I care about satisfaction of the physicians and staff? Yeah, probably a little bit, but that's not why we're there. You know, do I care about satisfaction of the family? Yeah, I think that's important too from a consult standpoint, but. I, what am I measuring? Was I useful to the family, whether or not the outcome was positive or negative? And the staff, I guess. So in conclusion, the ethics consultation seemed to be useful in resolving conflicts that may be inappropriately prolonging futile or unwanted treatments and are perceived to be beneficial. But might this also save money? So that was the overall amazing, you know, thing they came out with, but it turns out that they also saved some money in this. So some folks have argued that it's not a good idea to evaluate ethics consultation on the basis of cost. So there's good reason not to do that. Um, you know? However, the authors provide no guidance. They, they talk about this, how it's not good, it's not bad. I mean, it's not good to do that, but they don't really give us any guidance in this particular uh, text of what to do. 
again, this, this also is a critique of that um, study. The authors review the articles with the design of randomizing controlled trials to evaluate effectiveness of ethics consultation. And they said that RCT to evaluate effectiveness of ethics consultation is extremely difficult as long as two issues are not resolved. The first is the standardization of ethics consultation process. We don't have a standard way we do things. So to compare institutions in a way like you would the standard of care for a certain <coughs> clinical situation where people tend to do the same thing at all institutions, you can't do it here. And a placebo for ethics consultation to eliminate the placebo effect. Um, so that was their critique of, the, of uh, uh, studies like Shining. Uh, so with this move towards certification that I mentioned this morning, you might see then more study like this because there is going to be now, um, well, definitely a standardization as far as people that undergo some kind of certification. So there is going to be that. And there may be studies that look at whether certified consultants have better outcomes or mm -hmm. have improved communication or you know have those better skills than people that are not certified. But, but until we have this yeah. kind of critical mass of people that are certified, I think it's going to be really challenging. But you do bring up a good point in that if we as an organization or as a body of uh, experts in this area don't come up with our own kind of evaluation tool, likely we'll get one given to us by some institute, by some body. You know, because there is going to, you know, right now, again, when we look at the public, they don't have a clear understanding of what we do, and there is no standard basically, of what we do. We all do it different, and there's no real clear-cut thing that all folks could expect from someone who's certified, let's say, or licensed, you know. Well, you could argue that there is a standard of care, right? I mean, you could argue that in the absence of certification, yes. there's a standard of care, again, based on, and it's never been really, I think, litigated, but right. it could be a community standard, it could be a national, just like in medicine, we've had this community standard for a long time. Um, we have a standard of education, I guess. Standard that's standard of education, important. maybe, or standard of, uh, you know, competence, and so people can point to the four competencies. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so, you know, so I mean, and, but now that everyone's getting certified, it's going to be a more challenging yeah. to say, well, um, you know, we have nothing to point to. That's, and, a, that's yes. the whole standard. And it is important for us to have a standard, but also to have a way of evaluating that, I think. But so far, it's just been very difficult to come up with something. But those are good points. Now we have ASBH. Um, we don't have a process for consultation evaluation, but we're coming up with the core competencies and things like that that kind of help keep us all on the same page. Um, the VA system is one of the only systems that really does have a standardized way of doing things throughout their, their groups, and it's all computerized. Um, so they have an integrated ethics program, uh, but it's only available to the VA system. So they can keep good records on what they do, but again, um, it's not something that, that we can compare to. I've done online surveys for providers only, and I mostly got positive feedback because I was helpful, um, and that really wasn't helpful data for me. Um, so I kind of quit doing that um, at the time. And I've got a, a study that I'm doing at my <coughs> LTAC looking at just the process questionnaire and stuff like that. But I don't have a, lot, I don't have a large population yet to even look at that data. Um, but it's a, it's a project for some of us to do and to think about. So I was wondering if you might give us any insight. In, was it your program that you were trying to come up with an evaluation process through Madison, or not? No. Uh, I apologize. Uh, that's okay. Mark and Kahan asked if I would put together some pieces on assessing and evaluating ethics consultation, that in and of itself. So we talked about kind of three content areas. We've expanded that a little bit, four content areas. Quasi-like or here, looking at range oh. and all that's going on in real time. Definitions around what constitutes proficiency, um, okay. lack of proficiency, and some standards. But it's interesting, and, and this is something that I just like to encourage everyone uh, to take a look at. Um, I think we're having two shifts kind of crossing in the night. <laughs> um, Catholic Healthcare and ASBH are not dialoguing well, um, and that's part of our own problem as well. But at our, many of our larger systems, um, we are doing all of what is being asked of and kind of advancing some of these areas. 
but need to have dialogue partners. So the VA, I think, has done a great job. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to bring together a very interdisciplinary group of both secular and um, religious entities to have that dialogue around what are you doing in consultation tools? What are you doing to share massive databases and cohorts of information to look at that practice? Um, and we have you know, a rather robust tool both for charge and database, uh, access database to collect all of our consultation. We're reporting out on that. And we're looking at looking at the quality uh, structures around like Premier and Safer, all the systems that you have in from a clinical excellence standpoint, looking at the outcomes data, not in terms of the objectives that are achieved, but deviations in expected versus actual, which are quality corrected and risk adjusted already in the system when it goes in. Now you can retrospectively compare cohorts of patients that are just like China the study, where you're comparing cohorts that have had consultation with those that have not. And you can really start looking at the effectiveness of ethics consultation on a number of different markers uh, that are quality. So we can start telling our story, but we have to talk to each other. Right. And I think, I think, um, I think we all need to do a better job. Catholic healthcare sector, mm -hmm. everybody needs to do a better job on that. So um, we're still operating in our silos, which how healthcare operates. But it is. Trying to break some of those things down. So I appreciate your calls to, to do that type of work. Well, and I think about when <clears throat> I think about ethics consultation, then I'll wrap up. I think about the, what is the other service that we can compare our service with. And the only thing that I think is comparable is palliative care consults. Because they come in, they talk to the family or the patient about hospice. And if the family says, what do you mean? Get out, we're not talking about that. Is that a bad outcome? You know? They went in, they gave information. And so that's kind of like how I think of it. And I think they struggle with how to also evaluate their service. Because number of patients seen, um, what is the outcome if, if 2% or I don't even know what, what percent it would be, sign up for hospice, is that successful? You know? But that's like saying an internal medicine consult is only good if I find an internal medicine disease. Um, a, yes and no. But that's what I would judge on how well they do their medicine. Yeah, I also think that we need to evaluate that. And that's the process. But we have to think differently that ethics consultation is is above evaluation because we we have to do that somehow. And it, it, it's not on the outcome of did we get a DNR. It, it is on the process. And was that process helpful? Whether or not the family agreed with us. And so I think that's the challenge for us. But um, again. I'm not sure, and maybe you all could correct me, if we even have the raw data. In other words, um, how many times, how many of the ethics consults that we do, um, let's say change in code status, I'm not even sure that we know um, like how often those things occur, how often that occurs to yeah. know, to be able to say, well, but that's evaluation, you know, whether or not this is a good thing. We, we have uh, lots of data on um, issues, yeah, on what kind of issues, and they cluster, like you said, but um, that doesn't mean we can't. We have to start somewhere, and we do have some data. It's a challenge, and I want you guys to think about it as you go back and do your practice to, to decide. But we as an ASBH aren't quite sure how best to evaluate our consult activity. But believe me, I think it's important. And if we don't do it, someone's going to tell us how to do it. I think it's important as well, but I guess what I'm saying is we don't even know what the sort of lived experience is of ethics claims in general. I think we do, if you review the literature. There's a lot of literature. We've been around for 30-some years now. So it may not be as, as um, broken down like you went to how many DNR, you know. Because yeah. I don't think we've done that evaluation. Right. Yeah. We've done data collection on how many we do, how many have consults, services, how many of all that. Now we have to take it. And, and if you look at the um, literature here, we haven't had a good study on evaluation in several years. It's hard to do. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it's, it's a challenge for all of us. Anyway, yes. I think the palliative care is a good example to use because um, coming from palliative care, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the way we used to um, survey our patients and families and how we changed that survey to really get more of the information that we were looking for from them. Even things like um, permitting them to return a survey anonymously. You know, in the past, we had someone who made a phone call because we thought that was the only compassionate way to reach out to someone who might have lost a loved one. 
that we shouldn't send an impersonal survey for them. But then we had to realize they, they didn't have the potential to speak anonymously. They didn't have that option. So as we changed that and found a better way to just say, you can sign your name if you want to, but you don't have to. You know, we found that we got more surveys back and we found that people probably were a little bit more frank with criticism that might have been there all along. So, I mean, I could think of ways that we changed our survey process, even, even dropping the word satisfaction out of it because we really didn't want them to think of it as a satisfaction survey or a dissatisfaction survey. We just wanted feedback. And one thing that we noticed was that for a lot of families, the goal did not seem to be that the outcome was something they could think of as having been a good outcome. The goal for them was that they were listened to. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to make the biggest difference in how positively they rated the palliative care service or the consult was were you given the opportunity to express your whatever it was, fears, concerns, were you given the opportunity to ask your questions? So what we learned from it was that as a team, if we spoke less and listened more, we could start to influence how that whole process was being received. And our goal, we never really went in with a goal in mind um, of admission to hospice or change in a code status. We went in with lots of options that we felt like we needed to talk through and get feedback. And Sometimes it was just a matter of, you said earlier, people just had not spoken aloud the fears that were, I hope nobody mentions this, I hope nobody brings that up. Um, but they had thought about them. You know, it's not that they never thought of how is this all going to end. Yeah. But they did need somebody to be a little bit frank in saying, I think we're getting close. We don't know how close, but I think we're getting close to that time that you might have imagined someday would happen. Um, That's it was, a good point. And I'm glad that you agree that I think we're, we're kind There of are some like parallels. The, right. the purposes and the competencies are all different, but there are some parallels there. And I think changing the way we solicited evaluation and from whom really helped us um, change our program. Well, thank you. I appreciate that.